My name is Mario Cuomo. I'm here as a kind of change of pace. They said that there'd be a lot of intelligent humor before you get up, and what we expect of you is your typical somber seriousness. And uh, um, I'll, I'll give you as much of that as I can. They also asked me to try to inject into my own comments about Timothy something that suggested imperfection, not accused him of any imperfection, because <laughs> that would be too much, but suggested it, hinted at it, because there is this kind of relentless uh, instinct for praise, all of which he, uh, he deserves. I tried very hard to think of uh, a true imperfection, a lie perhaps. I said, what the heck, he was a lawyer? He ought to be able to do that. Um, <laughs> And, 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 and I couldn't quite get there because of his Jesuit background. Because the Jesuits, as you probably understand, and I'm sure there are many in the audience, uh, are very good at defense, even better than they are at condemning people to hell. So, the, <laughs> the, and, and he, had, he had the Jesuit education to, to, uh, to a perfection. And here's what happened. A true story. I've never told it before. <clears throat> but... I'm too old to run again, and so I can afford to tell it now. <laughs> the uh, the seatbelt law was perhaps the most unpopular uh, thing I did. It was the first seatbelt law in the United States of America, and it was followed by everybody except uh, New Hampshire, live free or die, uh, they chose to, <laughs> whatever. Uh, and... and <laughs> And, and I got it passed, and it was a wonderful thing in 1985. But the very next day, we were on a mission to Buffalo, which, of course, Tim was delighted by. And we went in a K-car, which the state police were then experimenting with, small K-cars, in a great caravan. Because one thing Buffalo could do is turn out troopers and police and, and give you a real parade. We are again experiencing some audio problems as we listen to the former governor of New York, who uh, Tim worked for for several years in the mid-80s, uh, Governor Mario Cuomo, of course, uh, Tim cutting his political teeth, uh, both with Mario Cuomo before that as a very young Moynihan, uh, Pat Senator Daniel Moynihan's chief of staff. Let's go back to uh, Governor Cuomo. Timothy jumps out of the car. The press jumps up out of the press's car. They run over. They say to Timothy, how was the governor? And here's what Timothy said. He didn't have practice. He had instinct. He had that great Jesuit education. He wasn't about to lie. He said, thank God for the seatbelt. Or one for ten. Yeah, I've known uh, I've known Tim since he served as a, a counselor to me in my first years as governor. He was already a very skilled lawyer and had been tutored in politics by a legendary master politician and statesman, Pat Moynihan. There wasn't much I could teach him there, but he thought that he might enjoy experiencing the more hands-on political work that comes with the executive responsibilities of a governor. And he did, in fact, enjoy it, although those first few years of the governorship were very difficult ones in New York at that time because of the onset of AIDS, which he had, we had not even heard about before the election was concluded in 82, and crack, crack co uh, cocaine, which was also something new, and homelessness, uh, like uh, nothing we had experienced since the Depression, and a 51-hour hostage negotiation with a homicidal inmates in Sing Sing prison that happened in the first week of our governorship. And for all those things, Timothy was with me and then went to the convention in 1984 when I gave a speech and then to um, Zoo Notre Dame when I gave another speech on abortion, all of which were chock full of uh, all kinds of interesting issues. Uh, and, he, uh, and he enjoyed it. He did enjoy it. And he told me once that he believed that politics could be a noble profession, even a saintly one. And he meant it, uh, if you did it right. He said it, it can be beautiful. He truly believed that. But gradually it became clear to me that he was even more intrigued by the journal.
Tim, of course, who uh, grew up in Buffalo, used to love to talk about his uh, time both on the staff of Moreo Cuomo and Daniel Patrick Moynihan, uh, some of the years that, that he recalled most fondly. Let's go back to Governor Cuomo. You, the most discerning and respected pursuers of political truth in the nation's history. You've heard Al, another great journalist, uh, and Tom Brokaw, and so many in recent days uh, talk about his mastery of the art of journalism. For most people, that'd be more than enough to deliver as a eulogy. You could stop there and make him a great journalist and have said enough for more people uh, than uh, others. But that's not enough for Tim Russett. And I've been thinking about that for days. It's not enough to think of him as a great journalist. Because how would that explain the tremendous outburst of anguished sadness the deep sense of personal loss that we're hearing from all over America, the tears shed by millions of people who knew him or felt that they knew him. And over and over you hear people saying, all I saw was Tim on Sunday mornings on television. I never saw him in person, but I felt that I knew him. How do you explain that? It's not because he was a great journalist. His success as a journalist was enough to win him respect, but it was not enough to win him love. And that's what millions of people feel for him. They loved his genuineness, his integrity. When he said he was working to make politics a truly noble profession, they believed him. They loved his profound devotion to his beautiful, talented wife, Maureen. To Luke, who already in his early manhood has begun to reflect his father's wondrous gifts. And his reverential respect for and affection for his father, Big Russ. And they knew that his genuineness did not end there. They knew that uh, he never forgot where he came from. As a matter of fact, he reminded us every Sunday morning, and we loved it. We loved to hear the stories about Big Russ and the bills and the parades and all the things that made him what he was and that he loved till the very end. And he did, uh, but there's one other thing about him, I think, that is the most important thing of all. Um, he was much more than a great lawyer, inquisitor, analyst, journalist, or political prognosticator. All of these characteristics are mentioned over and over. Uh, but there's one dominant reality in his life that charged all that he did, his work, his role as a son, husband, father, brother, and friend. And he did it all with a great joie de vivre, and we hear that over and over. And I think that's the key. He regarded a day spent without real enthusiasm as a sadly lost opportunity. And enthusiasm, enthusiasm is exactly the right word for it. The Jesuits who did such a good job teaching him probably taught him that the English word enthusiasm is from the ancient Greek word meaning a divine appreciation of the gift of life. And oh, how he loved life and how that has helped millions and millions of others to love all that he represents. We have lost the benefit of Tim's political wisdom at a time when we need it most, a time when we're beset with wars, economic failures, and confoundedly complicated social issues. It will be difficult, if not impossible, to replace that wisdom. But the inspiration he provided as an example of the life well led will be with us all until memory fails. Thank you.